All right, you guys ready to party? I was told this is going to be the most lit service. Listen, I already tried it three times, so I figured out what works. So you came to the best service. What an honor it is to be with you. Um, <laughs> you know, I have been rolling with Pastor Russell for a very, very long time. He's a dear friend and uh, was worshiping with him in, in this community back in the mortuary, back in the glory days with the dead bodies all around us. Um, and uh, so, of course, he naturally reached out to me and was like, hey, we're going to experiment with a bunch of random services. You should come. So, anyway... <laughs> I'm here. So it's good to be here. And, you know, this weekend we held our, our just our first ever kind of training gathering that we wanted to do to impart and train uh, leaders and, and, and revivalists to carry what God's entrusted us to over the last few years. Uh, it was an amazing time called Firestarters. And I was laughing because I had all these leaders across America reaching out. They're like, dude, like, you're so funny. Like, if there was one place that you wanted to launch an inaugural conference where you wanted to gather a lot of people and you wanted to, you know, make it easy and accessible and you wanted to, you know, rally support and donations, the one place you wouldn't go would be the Pacific Northwest. And I'm like, yeah, that's because I'm cut from a different cloth, man. I want to go to the blue places. I want to go... And, and, and I, there's, I've just been attracted my whole life. Like I grew up as a, as a missions kid. My parents were full-time medical missionaries. And we grew up going into the hardest and darkest places. And I, there was an attraction to me to see light overcome darkness. So that naturally that's just been something. And now I love Texas and I love Florida and I love all these Midwest places. And they're amazing and they're incredible. However, I know my assignment and I refuse to subscribe to the theology that when things get difficult, we retreat to easy places. Now, I can share that with authority because I live in California. The only place crazier than here. All right? And so I'm not just talking this as somebody that's, this is some great idea. No, I live with this day in and day out. What I have to pay for gas and taxes, for crying out loud. The taxes on my diesel truck would blow your mind. You know, and it's just, but at the same time, we have to refuse the narrative that God is calling us to hold out in a bunker in middle America somewhere and wait, out, wait the, the, the last days together. No, man, we're called to take ground for the kingdom. We're called to take territory. We're called to see the light shine in the darkness. And today is a great day to remind you, and this is my heart today, I want all of us to leave this service. I want all of us to exit this place in such a place of drunken victory. I want you guys to be so wrecked and so obnoxiously joyful. Now, it's funny because I brought these... These leaders with me this weekend, and a lot of them have never been to Seattle, and they're excited, and they've heard the stories, and they've watched some of our videos that are coming up here, and we land, and it's like, I mean, guys, you know, this weekend, it's like the glory is all around you. The mountains are out. The air is clear, and these, these people are like, it's so awesome, because God's tricking them. They're like, oh, this place is amazing. Man, I can't believe people get to live here. Man, look at this weather. This, look at the mountains. Look at the ocean. This is stunning. And I'm like, yep. Yeah. And my prayer was is that God would trick a lot of them to move here. Get them on a sunny day in the PNW. They don't know what hit them. <laughs> No, but I, I, I really, really am excited. I have a message I want to release to you guys. I feel like it's going to be something that you can carry with you throughout the year. I don't do itinerant events a lot. I don't do canned messages. I don't even really itinerate. I'm here because I love this church. I love this community. I love this region. A lot of you know I grew up in Montana. And um, so coming to Seattle was a big deal. It was the first city I ever laid eyes on with real skyscrapers. So the first basketball game I ever went to was the Supersonics. 
and I will press in with deep groaning and intercession till they return. It's going to be a sign of revival. I woke up with this verse for you guys, though, out of Zechariah 10.7. Uh, the Lord gave this to me. The Ephraimites will become like warriors. Like this whole narrative, I just am so sick of it. Oh, the people in the Pacific Northwest are so beat down, and it's so difficult, and it's so hard, and it's like we succumb to this. We partner with this victim mindset where we're always victimized, and we're always the bottom of the barrel, and we're always the, you know, the tail and not the head, and we're always depressed and hopeless and suicidal, and you don't know what it's like to live here. And we cheapen the power of the cross. We cheapen the sacrifice of Jesus. We cheapen the ability to be overcomers. So it says Ephraimites will become like warriors and their hearts will be glad as with wine. There's going to be a lot of wine references today. (laughs) Their children, by the way, it's Mother's Day coming up. You want to hear a little bit of my Mother's Day? I got time. We got time. We ain't got another service, so a little bit of my Mother's Day sermon. I'm going to let you all. Okay, so Jesus has this great idea of what he's going to do for his first miracle. And his mom steps in and she goes, we're out of wine. I mean, if this is not the most ridiculous thing you've ever heard of. Jesus, who's God, tells his mom, hey, it's not really my time. God is telling his mom It's not my time. And mom tells God, I'll tell you when it's your time. (laughs) The barrels are right over there. (laughs) I felt the glory on that. Moms don't play games. And so Jesus' first miracle is is making more wine for drunk people. Um, It's literally the Bible. You can read it. Uh. Their children will see it and be joyful, and their hearts will rejoice in the Lord. So, so it, it's this thing about this. The, the, they're warriors, but they're warring from a place of gladness and joy. And their children recognize the source of their battle is one of joy. This is my desire for the Pacific Northwest, for this church, for Pursuit. Uh, we got a lot of cool churches, a lot of cool brands, a lot of amazing stuff. I love it. It's great. It's incredible. I love it. I'm, I'm all about it. Brands and names and campuses and all this kind of stuff. But what I am more hungry for is a people that live in perpetual joy and throw off the cloak and the bias and the mindset of darkness and witchcraft and all the kind of stuff that people say you succumb to, and they become the walking anomaly. They live and breathe and work and function as the most happy, annoying Christians you've ever seen. Let's just face it. To walk around and to be, and I, listen, I'm, I preface this by Mentioning again, I led the largest protests in America against Disney, perverting our children. I led the largest protests in America. I led them against Target. I led the largest protests against COVID mandates. Nobody in all of America had gatherings bigger than ours. Okay? I know how to fight. I know how to stand up. I know how to stand for truth. I'm not afraid. I'll fight for my kids. I get all that. However, I don't believe that we are called to be known as grumpy, angry Christians. Where we're always angry and agitated. Well, the world does this. I can't believe it. And we send stuff around. Can you believe it? I can't believe it. They're so filled with demons. And it's like our whole life. It's like 2024. The whole purpose of the media is to get us in a frenzy. Y'all hearing me? You're going to have to record this one for the podcast. This will be the best one. They want to get us in a frenzy. They want to get us... divided. They want to get us distracted. They want to get us discouraged. This is why I said at the beginning of the year, 
We're raising up 100,000 intercessors. We refuse to allow this year to be one of turmoil and one of chaos. It's going to be a year of prayer and presence. We're shifting the narrative. This is a year of prayer and presence. And the Lord gave me a word. Raise up 100,000 intercessors. If you want to join our list, you can text PRAY to 2022. P-R-A-Y to 2022 And we will send you a prayer guide. Our next prayer guide comes out tomorrow morning. It costs me a lot of money to do this. We don't get anything from it. It costs money to publish these text messages and send it out. But we do it because it's a mandate that we have. This is called to be a year of prayer and presence, right? We cannot allow the world to define. Like, like, okay, let me just put it in simple terms. It's bad marketing for Jesus. How about we just say that? Well, I'm standing for truth, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing all these conservative pundits. And I'm like, no, you're just angry and mean. It is possible to stand for truth and righteousness. It is possible to mobilize people to stand and do it from joy. It is possible to be happy, almost annoyingly happy. I mean, I get flack from some of the conservative pundit people because it's like, well, Sean's just always the hope guy. He lives on hopium. I'm like, bro, listen. (laughs) Yeah, I'm the hope guy. I'll take that. And you know what? I was attacked way more than you. I get death threats sent to my house every day. I had this satanic temple doing 24 hours of seances and demonic, uh, demonic uh, 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 services against my family. I've had things and experienced spiritual attacks in ways that you never have. Because you sit behind a desk as a keyboard warrior and tweet. I want to go to cities and see darkness displaced. But I want to do it from joy because joy is sustainable. And I'm going to have a happy marriage and I'm going to have a happy family. And we're going to have a lot of fun watching God kick the devil's teeth in. And we're going to laugh and we're going to party and we're going to make jokes and it's going to be awesome. And this is a life we're called to live in. And I just feel bad for those people that's kind of like either either they take themselves too seriously or they think it all relies upon them or they just think it's cool to be mad. And I'm like, it ain't cool no more. In 2024, we need to be the obnoxiously joyful people. So when I landed in Seattle, um, I wanted to bring a lot of these young leaders we had with us. I mean, this room was packed full of world changers this weekend. Y'all have no idea what hit Snohomish over the last two days. But we had some leaders in here that are taking America by storm and they're doing Jesus marches across the biggest cities in our nation and they're mobilizing young people and they're baptizing thousands in the Pacific Ocean. It's incredible. Well, a lot of them never been to Seattle and they've seen our videos and they've, they've, they've heard the stories and they've read the articles. And so I wanted to bring, bring them to, uh, to, to my favorite grimy, gnarly Seattle spot, Capitol Hill. So we landed, and I was like, y'all ready for this? Let me show you Seattle. So we drove in. We crossed, I think, like 14 rainbow crosswalks. And we drove right into Cal Anderson Park, where we hosted Let Us Worship in 2020 at the height of the Chop Chaz Insanity. Anybody here in this room, go with us there. You were there. You were there. It was wild. Unlike anything I've ever experienced. And, you know, it was the autonomous zone. It was blocked off. This is our territory. The police can't come in here. And, of course, the city officials are so weak sauce. They're like, we're not going to do anything. You know, people are getting murdered. People are getting raped. I mean, it's like horrendous anarchy and destruction. And the media is having a field day. And they're just trashing Seattle. And they're trashing the Pacific Northwest. And they're just, this place is a dumpster fire. I can't believe, you know, there's an autonomous zone. And it was this fight with the feds and the local. And I was in the middle of that, actually. We had feds that showed up that weren't supposed to be there, but they were there. They showed up, actually, when we got kicked out of your, uh, your beautiful city, kicked us out of, um, what was that park we went to? Gasworks Park. They conveniently put barricades up. Because Christians are so dangerous. And we were like, all right, cool. We'll just set up down the street. So we set up on a construction site. 
But anyway, in 2020, when we did that, and the, all of America had been seeing fear and paranoia and, and, and destruction and anarchy, and then all of a sudden they look and they see this picture, and they see some long-haired guy with a Supersonics jersey, no shoes on, dancing in the middle of Chop Zone, with 3,000 happy Christians. One of the things I love about blue states, can I just say this? Like, we don't do church charity. It's not like a church culture. You come to church, you come to worship thing, you're for real. You're coming to do battle. You ain't playing games. When I saw the intercessors get out of their cars, and I saw the faces of the Antifa guys, I'm like, it's about to go down. <laughs> These Antifa guys, they, ain't, they don't know what they're in for. These are intercessor mamas that are about to break Leviathan off of all their lives. Don't mess with the intercessors. And so anyway, we went in there. This guy behind me, I just thought was funny. The, the joy of the Lord hit that park so hard. This dude, it was, this Muslim guy starts dancing behind me. It's Seattle. Anything happens, right? And he, he ends up confessing his love for Jesus, wants to get free, takes his head thing off. We're praying over him. All these amazing things are happening. But in the midst of this, they're antagonizing. They're trying to unplug our gear. They unplug our, our, uh, our generator a few times. They pour super glue on our keyboard. They kick in our dr the heads of our drum set. They're just d destructive, right? And it's just kind of like a, a, like a like childhood bully thing. They think they're going to stop us. And I'm like, bro, we just survived Portland last night. We ain't backing down. We kept worshiping. We kept singing. The power went out. The people never stopped worshiping. And at one point, it was so intriguing that a guy was there with the Antifa crew that uh, he was the main live stream guy. He live streamed all of the rioting, all of the, he was on YouTube and on Facebook, and he had the, the biggest following of the live stream. And people, even major news outlets, would tap into his live stream to find out what was happening, where the riots were happening, where the marches were happening, all that kind of stuff. And so he's there, and he's been broadcasting through his channel destruction, fear, anarchy, violence. And all of a sudden, he's out of worship thing, and he decides to pop open the live stream. And so people, night after night after night after night after night after night, are seeing destruction, violence. They're seeing this clash with the police. They're seeing these people just complete and total insanity. And all of a sudden, now they see 3,000 Christians worshiping. Look at God. And so during his live stream, he starts getting frustrated and he goes on a profanity-laced tirade because he doesn't get why the Christians won't stop. Take a listen. Now that looks like a joy party. Look at us. Look at that. Look at that. Now watch what he says. This is this is great. This this clip right here went viral. Them, the better they, the more fun they have. The more fun they have, dude. It's ridiculous. <laughs> he said, "The more I yell at them, the more fun they blankety blank have. The more blankety blank fun they have. This blank is ridiculous." And he was so overcome because he didn't know why we were so joyful. We were supposed to be scared. We were supposed to be intimidated. We were supposed to be hiding. We were supposed to be worried. And all of a sudden, he encountered a bunch of worshipers that were more connected to that reality than this reality. And what happened? The power of God broke out. I mean, that guy, the poor guy, he came down. I say poor guy, but he came down, and he was just so shook, and he started asking our team, why are you guys like this? We heard Christians were da-da-da-da-da, but you guys are so happy, and it's so annoying, and you, you won't stop. And then all of a sudden, while he's speaking, all this, like eight intercessors surround him and just go, da -da 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 -da. <laughs> the dude was in the line of fire, <laughs> and it was over. Like, and, and if there's anything that scares these guys, it's intercessors and the Holy Ghost. They can't take it. 
People got baptized that night, saved. We had a, 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 one of the satanic high priest guys that was walking around, give his life to Jesus. I mean, I could go on and on and on. But the biggest thing about that was for the first time, the world saw joy in the midst of fear breaking off discouragement, depression, and hopelessness. That year, or that day, Franklin Graham actually posted that clip, which became the number one shared Facebook post in the world, was worship from the chop zone. Joy is contagious. John 16, it says this, these things I've spoken to you, that in me you might have peace in the world, you shall have tribulation. Dun, da, da, dun. Uh, for some reason, we have subscribed in the West to a very safe, docile Christianity. I mean, you would not imagine, I could list the names of people, you would know a lot of them, who absolutely harassed and slandered me that I would dare invite people to worship in the dark city of Seattle. So I'm like, I thought that's what we're called to do. <laughs> what happened to our theology? Where we've elevated safety. Well, if you just, you know, if you really love your neighbor, you're going to wear four masks and watch a live stream in your room alone while they're dying and about to kill themselves. And we cannot subscribe. So, so Jesus is saying, listen, in this world you're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer. But in the midst of the trials, in the midst of the tribulations, which will come. Someone say amen. They will come. They'll continue to come. You live in a fallen world. You're going to have a heartache. You're going to have despair. You're going to have discouragement. You're going to have disillusionment. You're going to have times of, 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 uh, of, of sickness. You're going to have times where you don't understand things. But in the midst of all that, you can be of good cheer. Why? Because I have overcome the world. Because I know the end of the story. Well, you don't understand, Sean, in 2024, we don't have the election and it's rigged. And if we don't do this and we don't know. And it's like we build this whole thing of our life where we're so insecure and we're more tied to the systems of the world. And it's like, dude, don't you know that, like, he wrote the story? I get the privilege. One of the cool things I get to do, our ministry headquarters is actually in Washington, D.C., we have a place called Camp Law that's on Capitol Hill. It's a, it's a block away from the Supreme Court and two blocks away from the Capitol. And yes, we are the crazy Christians. We do marches around the Supreme Court. We worship inside of the Capitol. We're crazy. And I get the privilege of walking in those, the, the epicenter of freedom and democracy for the world. I mean, you step into the Capitol, into the rotunda, that real estate is the symbol of freedom for mankind. Nowhere has promoted freedom to the nations, released religious liberty, promoted the gospel. I don't care what you say about the Foundation of America and they're trying to rewrite it. That building before it housed Congress was actually a church. The first activities that happened inside the Capitol Rotunda was a church service. And so when I'm standing in there and I'm looking at the portraits and I'm looking at the story of what God's done, I'm able to say, God, you're not done with the story yet. You're not finished writing the story. And so my hope isn't in, election, isn't in an election or a political candidate or a platform. My hope is in a God that is writing the story. And when you're in there and you're worshiping, something happens where you realize you're appealing to a higher authority. Now, here's a cool thing, just throwing this out there. From Washington to Washington, we just purchased our sound equipment in Washington. And we raised a bunch of money. I felt like the Lord said that it was time for us to get our own gear and our own equipment because we keep getting canceled and censored and, and we have... All of these woke sound companies that cancel on us last minute. And they leave us scrambling all the time. It's happened so many times. And plus, we paid millions of dollars for these productions. And I felt like the Lord said, time to get your own. 
So we got our own, and for the first time yesterday, I went and laid hands on all our equipment. It's sitting in a garage a few miles from here. In a Russian garage. So don't try to mess with these guys. They don't play. <laughs> they do have good borscht, though. Um, but anyway, in this garage, we have, you know, 16 speakers and eight subs, and we have two sound boards because if Antifa trash is one, we got an extra spare. And it's so cool, guys. Listen to how cool this is. We are, this sound equipment is going to be put into our box truck that we just bought. It's going to be wrapped with the most insane, annoying wrap you've ever seen with lions and bald eagles and American flag and, and G's. I mean, it's crazy. It's going to be a showstopper like your billboards. Uh, and it's going to be driving across the country from Seattle to Florida, carrying the sound from the city of sound to 22 U.S. capitals. These are the 22 capitals on my back right here. 22 U.S. capitals finishing in Washington, D.C. nine days before the election. So all this prophetic stuff about the sound of Seattle and the sound and, and Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin and the EMP and Kurt Cobain and the drugs and the sex and the rebellion that's been released from this city, even today God is redeeming that sound. And we're taking the sound and we're bringing it, the sound of worship to King Jesus across America all the way from Washington to Washington. Come on, somebody. God is writing a story. He's writing a story. Ephesians 5.18, I want to read this. This gives us a manual on how to respond in days like this. Verse 15, it says this. Be careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every opportunity. I was hit <clears throat> driving to sound check last night with this really heavy revelation again. About time, making the most of every opportunity. And thinking about how many times I've driven to a sound check. And how many times I've been tired and exhausted and... I don't know what I'm doing. And it's like, I, I was my, one of my favorite questions I always get from people like on worship panels. I used to do a lot of worship panels. I was on a very well-known record label and I did tours and I would do these worship panels and people would gather and they'd be like, you know, one of the questions I would always get was, do you always feel the glory? Isn't, are you just always caught up in the swirl when you're, and I'd look at them and it was very, probably disappointing answer. I'd be like, you know what? Sometimes I'm up there and I'm like just hungry I like want to eat something. Or I'm up there and I miss my wife. Or I'm up there and I'm thinking, what the heck am I doing here? But I make a decision in the moment that he's worth it. And I make a decision. No, you, are you always in the glory? No, probably like 4% of the time. And I love those 4% moments. But the rest of the time, I'm making a decision. You know what? My days are numbered. The only thing I'll never get back is time. And I will never regret in the history of my existence choosing to worship in this moment. When you guys look back, all of you people look back on your life, you're never going to be like, I can't believe we went to church so much. No, you're probably going to be like, man, we probably should have not binged on Netflix that much. You probably should have not stressed out about this and this and that. We probably, like, if anything, you're going to look at moments when you were in the glory worshiping and you'll be like, that's when we really got it. That's when we remember what it's about. And so he's saying in Ephesians, listen, if you want to make the most of every opportunity, let me tell you how. Because the days are evil, therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Don't get drunk on wine. There's, there comes in wine again. Which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. 
In other words, in the same way that drunk people act, you should be so in the spirit. What's the number one thing that was said about the early church on the first meeting they had? I'll tell you what it was. Man, those people are cool. They're so intellectual. Did you hear that sermon? Dude, did you see what, did you see his fit? Man, he was dripping. That was fire. Skinny jeans were fire. Their brand was so cool in that church. Man, they were just, their structure and their organism was almost like a concert. Was, no, no, that was not what they said. The first thing they said was, these people are drunk. These people look drunk. How I long for the church in America for that to be said about us again. We don't get said about that too much because we're too worried about what people think. They didn't give a rip. They were so drunk. They were so disconnected from this reality. And it says, do not be drunk on wine, but instead be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with songs, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, he's saying you should always be living in the Spirit. You never turn off the praise. You never turn off the prayer meeting. Now, I got in a lot of heat the last couple weeks because I dared to talk against America's sacred golden calf of Taylor Swift. How dare you touch that? At least give us that, Sean. And I don't even care. I don't even, I'm not into like these cultural battles, but I just heard the Lord tell me like, you need to write something, you need to expose something. So I did and it was just like, <laughs> you know. And I'm just like, I don't understand what the controversy is. I don't want my 13-year-old daughter listening to that. Why is that a controversial thing? I don't like the idolization. I don't like the demonic aspects. I don't like that they're hanging out at a Super Bowl with a girl doing demonic signs with an upside down cross. Why is that weird? You can do whatever you want to do. You know, do you and do your life. But for me, there's no need for that. I don't want that in my home. I don't want that in my car. I don't want a bunch of men hating songs about whatever. I want worship. I want the presence now, I have fun, guys. I don't live in, the, in a constant little church bubble. I love to go to football games. I love to experience fun. I love to go to concerts. I love all that. But there comes a point where it's like, okay, are we going to live in wisdom? Are we going to be the people that rise above the, the, the noise of our culture? Are we going to get free from this mental fog that's gripping a whole generation? I'll tell you one way to cleanse your spirit from the mental oppression and the heaviness. Stop scrolling and start praising. It's not difficult. Well, you don't understand what I've been through and I need this and I have trauma and therapy and all that. No, listen. The power of Jesus is enough. I have seen the wildest testimonies you would ever imagine. And I am not trying to cheapen anybody's life experience. I'm not trying to cheapen the fact of what you've been through. I understand people in this room have been through very difficult things. But I'm telling you, the blood of Jesus is enough. You do not have to live your life as a perpetual victim. You do not have to bow at the altar of your depression and your suicide, and your mental battles. You can be free, and you can enter into a sound of praise that will take over every atmosphere you walk into. You can live in joy. You can be free from depression. You can beat off the powers of anxiety. You don't have to live in prescription drugs. Speaking to one another with songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. You can be the annoying, cheerful, happy Christians that don't shut up. The reality of Seattle, this is what I love. This is why I come here. I get invitations to come all, all over the world, but I love coming to the crazy blue states. It's so fun. I love to see how God overcomes. Seattle is just ranked number one, the least religious and unchurched city in America, beating out San Francisco, 
pretty hard thing to do. It's the least religious metro area. And you go into the statistics and some of you are like, that's not, that's not my county. Yeah, it is. 64% of adults never attend church or religious services or go less than once per year. 1.98 people out of 3.1 million population age 18 or older in King, Pierce, and Snohomish counties. This beats out San Francisco, New York as the least religious. So you look at these facts, and this is why I love it. I'm like, okay, Pastor Russell, you want to do 19 services. You want to have 85 campuses. Well, you know what? You're probably in the right place to do that. It's funny because I'm with a lot of other people that are like, (laughs) they're like, just temper it. Just, you know, balance. Slow down. And I'm always the one, go harder. (laughs) Push the limits. Like, I just believe, man. Like, you look at John the Baptist, there is no such thing as balance. That's a wild dude. And this is why I love Pastor Russell and other people here. I, I was telling one of the earlier services, I like finding people with wild eyes. I mean, Russell's got some wild eyes. You look at him, you're like, you're half crazy. And I like it. And I look at you and I feel more normal. Because I'm half crazy. You know, and it takes a group, a company of people to actually believe maybe God could flip the script. Maybe he could take our community and our devotion and our worship and our consistency. And maybe he could turn a whole city. Maybe he could broadcast the sound of worship from Washington to Washington. Maybe he could raise up a company of people like, like maybe, maybe, and it takes somebody kind of half crazy to try to do it. And I'm all for it. Burn, baby, burn. We got too many safe churches. We got too many people trying to manage Goliath. Just manage him over here. And he can come out once a day, but he just, you know, keep the... And David's like, whoever said you need to manage giants? Giants are meant to fall. We're not in the giant management business. And this is why I love it. And I pray that God keeps sending young people and wild people here. And I pray that they come during beautiful weather so they get tricked. And I pray that they come and they're unaware of the unchurched nature and they're unaware of the witchcraft and they're unaware of the hardship and they're unaware of the pain people have experienced for years and years. I pray they come with childlike eyes knowing that he's more than enough to overcome. That's a gift to you. When you encounter people that don't know what they're up against, that's a gift. You say, I want more of that. We had a girl, (laughs) we send mission teams all over the world, and I think we're doing 16 nations this year with Light a Candle. If you want to come on a mission trip, we'd love to have you. We're crazy. But one of my favorite things is watching these missionaries go out into lands and nations of, like, deep darkness and ancient strongholds, and they're just kind of, like, waltzing in there with their passport in their backpack with the audacity that God could show up on their 10-day trip. How foolish. And then this little blonde-haired girl from the Midwest walks up to this guy. You're not supposed to speak to a Muslim dude in Iraq like this, but she doesn't know any different. She starts prophesying over this guy, starts praying over him, speaks a little Arabic in her prayer, which was weird because she didn't even know it. She thought it was tongues. All of a sudden it came across as Arabic. The guy starts weeping. He gives his life to Jesus. That guy ends up planting a church. Come on, don't you know when you come into this country, you got to come in a certain protocol and you can't really talk to men. You can't do this. and You need to learn the language. You need to learn the customs. You can't really do that. And she just didn't know any better. And I feel like part of the joy thing, guys, on us and what we took into CHOP is we just don't know any better. I told the Antifa bros, I said, listen, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. This ain't your property. (laughs) This belongs to the king of all kings. 
And so we're going to worship in here, and we're going to smile, and you're going to try to stop us, but you will be unsuccessful. We don't need a sound system. We don't need our keyboard. You already trashed it. We don't need our generator. Well, we just have our voices. And there's a joy that God wants to release. I want you guys to stand up. I want to pray over you. Shirabasa. Today is St. Patrick's Day. Check out my shoes. Let's go. He's got the old supersonics glory on it. You know, St. Patrick was a wild revivalist. A couple of y'all are like looking at me. I thought it was a day where we drink beer and wear green. No. St. Patrick was one of the craziest revivalists that we know of in history. He was not born in Ireland. He was born in Britain. He was captured by Irish pirates and smuggled over as a slave to Ireland where his job was to tend to pigs as a slave. It was in his enslavement camp that he had an encounter and met God. He began to build this relationship with the Lord in his enslavement camp, so much so that in his writings, he thanks God that he became enslaved. Talk about trauma. He gets a dream. The Lord tells him it's time to leave. He leaves. He escapes, runs through mountains and forests and fields, gets onto a ship, finds a ship, gets gets to be a stowaway on a ship. The ship takes off. They encounter all this difficulty. He doesn't eat for 28 days because they run out of food. Miracle after miracle after miracle happen. It's crazy. He lands finally back in Britain. He meets his family. They can't believe he's alive. They thought he was dead. They... He's, he's back home. It's unbelievable. He's home for a little bit. He gets a dream from a man calling him back to Ireland. He can't shake the dream. His family says, you, no, St. Patrick, you, don't, you, can't, you can't go back there. Patrick, you can't go back to that place of your enslavement. You got free. God freed you. He said, I feel like I'm supposed to go back to the land of pagans to the land of Druid priests, witchcraft, sorcery. He can't shake it so much that he goes back and it says, he wrote that I will go back obediently and joyfully. (laughs) So he goes back, he starts revival. Revival's breaking out across Ireland. People are getting saved in the, the Druid witchcraft priests and sorcerers don't like this it's bad for their business so they're plotting to find ways to kill saint patrick the king however is very intrigued and so he extends an invitation for him to come to the capital city come to the palace and meet him and explain to him what this power is that he's carrying the druid priests think this is awesome as soon as he comes we're going to entrap him we're going to catch him on faulty charges and we're going to convict him and we're going to kill him and they're like because he knows we're going to do this he probably won't shut up he probably won't show up well to their surprise one random day saint patrick walks into the capital this is so good as he's walking into the capital come on somebody to the land of his enslavement as he's walking back he starts to sing this song that we all know Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ when I arise, Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in every eye that sees me, Christ in every ear that hears me. And he's singing and declaring and prophesying and chanting and he walks into the capital and he walks up to the king and he preaches to the king and he prophesies over him. That day the king gives his life to Jesus. Come on. All the sorcerers and the priest and the darkness is bound and he leaves the capital city bringing salvation to the king and the kingdom that once enslaved him. 
And he goes out baptizing, prophesying, planting churches, planting revival. And when he dies on March 17th, it's the day he died, St. Patrick's Day, March 17th, 465 AD, he left behind a once pagan island totally transformed. That was one guy. One guy. One guy's legacy. Might I ask you today, what would he do with your life in the Pacific Northwest? A pagan land, a land of darkness, a land of hopelessness. And there's a lot more than one Patrick in this room. Fighting off the victimhood, the trauma, the pain, the enslavement, and saying, God, I'm joyfully and obediently walking into this season, singing, smiling, laughing, and praising. If you're here today and you're like, Sean, man, that my heart is burning. I want to be a part of that sound of joy. I want you just to come down front real quick. I want to pray over you. Come on. Don't take long. Don't take long. Come down front. I want to pray. And listen, I feel like this is a powerful thing. It's not just like another charismatic altar call. I feel like for us today, we're making the decision we are going to live in joy. We're making the decision we're going to turn off every voice of negativity and skepticism and cynicism. Now, that doesn't mean you're not unaware of what's going on, but it just means that we break our addiction to bad news. We break our addiction to walking around like a bunch of church thermometers. Ooh, it's dark. Ooh, it's cold. Ooh, it's difficult. Ooh, this. Ooh, that. And we change our mindset to be, we're going to be thermostats. We're going to walk into Starbucks and change the temperature. We're going to walk into businesses and change the temperature. We're going to walk into Capitol Hill. Oh, you better be ready. It used to be dark. It used to be hard. It used to be difficult. Now it's a joy party. And guess what? You're broadcasting it all over the world. Tricks on you. (laughs) Come on, just lift your hands. Shake off the heaviness. Come on, just say, shake off the heaviness. Come on, sing that with me. Come on, sing that with me. Come on. Oh, and shake off the heaviness. Woo! We say, shake off the heaviness. Come on, shake it off. Shake it off. Come on, shake off the heaviness. And shake off the heaviness. Come on, one more time. Shake it off. Come on. Oh, and shake off the heaviness. And shake off the heaviness. Now say, give me joy. Say, give me joy. Oh, give me joy, 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 joy. Oh, and shake off the heaviness. Woo! Come on. Oh, and shake off the heaviness. Come on, all the oppression, all the fear. Oh, and shake off the heaviness. Now give me joy, give me joy, give me joy. Oh, give me joy, 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 joy.
that it fill you. Come on and joy, 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 joy. Come on, just begin to pray in the spirit. Come on, just begin. Come on, fill us, fill us, fill us, fill us. before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ to my right, Christ to my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ when I arise. We thank you, Jesus. I just commission the most annoyingly joyful people that the PNW has ever seen. I thank you, Lord, today, God, that you're commissioning us as a new generation of St. Patrick's. And I just feel prophetically some of you are going to go back to the places of enslavement and bring deliverance. And I, I don't know fully what that means, but I feel like for some it could be a neighborhood or it could be a place of pain or it could be an industry or, you know, I'm, I'm never going back there again. I'm never going to go back. It's like, and I feel like the Lord's saying, don't be like Jonah. Don't resist. Don't resist. But be like St. Patrick. Go with joy. He who's in you is greater than he who's in the world. The power in you can break every chain. The freedom in you is going to set people on fire. I thank for those in here, Lord, that you've positioned in different businesses. You've positioned in different industries. I thank you, God, that we want a wholesale takeover. People are like, you're just a Christian nationalist. You want God to be in control of everything. I'm like, exactly right. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. You want God to be over the government? Yes. You want God to be over education? Yes. You want God to be over business? Yes. You're all right. Guilty as charged. Lord, we pray wherever field, wherever culture, whatever industry, whatever assignment that you have on their life, God, we pray this would be a season of expectation and joy. This would be a season of surprise miracles. Shikara. Enjoy, joy, joy. We pray, God, just like that first verse in Zechariah 10, that this would be a multi-generational joy party where the children will even take note. And we pray for all of the children. We pray for the prodigal sons and daughters. We thank you. This is a season of them recognizing and seeing the joy and coming home. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Well, bless you guys. 
Let's have another service. Now, <laughs> hey, on your way out, you can pick up. We got some shirts and stuff like this. All of this goes to our ministry and helps us. We got lions on everything. I'm telling you, lions are coming back. So grab a shirt, grab a, a, a hoodie or a jacket or a hat or something like that. Join us, please, on this journey. Pray for us as we take our sound over to Florida in the next week. Pray for us. Pray for a supernatural gas efficiency, fuel efficiency. And uh, hopefully we'll see you in Washington, D.C. God bless you guys.